the authenticity of the scriptures, historicity of the scriptures, and the eyewitness evidence. In other words, we're asking the question, how accurate is the Bible? Knowledge of the Bible is very important for an apologist. Knowledge not just of the contents, but knowledge of how to defend the authenticity of the contents of the Bible. This is an area that is becoming more and more commonly under attack by outsiders, by non-Christians, by atheists, by Muslims. If they can undermine the authority of the Bible, then they have gone a long way into uh, undermining Christianity itself and the belief basis for the Christian. So this is a very, very important area to have uh, a knowledge of defense, a knowledge of the historicity, a knowledge of the different answers that can be given, and ultimately what the Christian wants, the Christian apologist wants, is um, the ability to be confident in the Word of God, that this is the very Word of God, and it is authentic, it is helpful, and it does answer the questions that we have for this life that we are in. So, let's look at some of the questions that are often brought up by people who do not believe in the authenticity of the Bible. Some ask, isn't the Bible full of contradictions and errors? Well, when they bring those up, will you be ready to answer those questions and show that they aren't contradictions? Some ask, the Bible has been copied and translated so many times. Hasn't this process led to errors? After all, if you copy something over and over and over again, then you're bound to make errors, and can we believe those errors today? Some ask this, how can you be sure that the Bible is the same now as when it was written? Do we have a different Bible today? This is often brought up by Muslims who say that our Bible has been corrupted and we don't have the, the uh, authentic, original Injil or Gospel that was given to Jesus uh, from heaven. Some will say, or ask this, didn't the church arbitrarily decide which books should be included in the Bible and which books should be rejected? After all, it took several hundred years before the canon of the Bible was sealed and the, uh, the selection of books was made. How do we know that uh, those are the ones that God wanted in there, that are inspired, that are truly the Word of God? It's a good question. So many people have different interpretations of the Bible. What makes you think that yours is correct? Now this, of course, is a question of hermeneutics, interpretation of the Bible. And how do we know that when we look at certain words or certain phrases or certain chapters that we have the correct interpretation? Theology rests upon that. How can you place your faith in a book that condones genocide and slavery? Because after all, slavery seems to be accepted. Um, Joshua is told to go in and commit harem or wipe out whole cities. How can we trust a God who tells people to do that? That's another good question. Or this, doesn't the Bible make a number of claims that are scientifically inaccurate? The sun rises, the sun sets, but it doesn't really rise. It doesn't set. The earth goes around the sun, so on. How do you deal with those particular questions? Is God worthy of worship if he kills innocent children? As it talks about in the Psalms, where God says, dash the children upon the rocks. What kind of God are we talking about? So people have questions about the, the scriptures, not only the content, but whether we can really trust that this is what God has given us. Well, the real question, of course, in all of this is, can we trust the Bible? Do we have scriptures that we can live by and die by? 
Charles Templeton, if you remember, was um, a friend of Billy Graham, uh, an evangelist in his day, and uh, one who turned away from the Lord and had a hard time putting things together. And it really disrupted his whole life. But this is what he said. It is no longer possible for an informed man or woman to believe that the Bible is either a reliable document or, as a Christian church insists, the infallible word of God. Now, he came upon this, um, this understanding or this view, this perspective, due to um, looking at the evil in the world and not being able to reconcile a good God with with um, so much evil, so much pain and suffering. And so he could not uh, reconcile the Word of God with an actual existing God. So he had difficulties with that. What would you say to a Charles Templeton? What would you say to someone else who questions what the Bible says? Well, first we have to look at some uh, main issues, and we'll deal with these three throughout the rest of uh, this part as well as the next two parts on the authenticity of the Bible. Three responses to the question, can you trust the Bible? Number one, well, you can say, well, the Bible is not reliable. Or number two, there are certain problems with the Bible, but generally you can pick and choose and find something reliable. Or number three, the Bible is reliable and authentic and trustworthy. So, to look at that again, can we trust the Bible? Some will say no, some will say maybe, but the Bible has problems, and some will say yes. How can we move the no people and the maybe people to the yes side? That's what we are charged with. And some, of course, will say the Bible is not trustworthy. Very bad feeling about this. Yeah, Luke Skywalker has a bad, a bad feeling about this, and so do many others. Okay, so let's look at a chart and see the flow of the argument. As an apologist, what do you do when somebody has this question? Can we trust the Bible? Well, first of all, if they say no, then we need to deal with their false impressions. Have they actually read the Bible? Or are they just dealing with second and third hand information? What do they know about the Bible? Uh, what do they know about the history? What do they know about the contents? And that's where you need to go into the bibliographical test and the internal test and the external test. Because if we are able to do this, then uh, the conclusion of these tests should bring that person who doesn't know much about the Bible to a realization that they are very um, very misinformed. So with these tests, with the reliability of the, the biblical documents test, the bibliographic test, the internal test, the external test, we should be able to bring the person to the conclusion that the Bible is reliable. Now there may be some other objections that they have. Um, but if we can bring them to the point where they at least accept that the Bible has validity, it may have problems, but we can deal with those problems and we should be able to. Sometimes we need to show people that uh, the Bible is unique. It's uh, different from any other book and um, there is great import in that. There are also beneficial effects of the Bible as people have read through, they, their lives have been changed. How many books do that to such an extent? Something is going on, and the Bible has uh, a power that uh, few books, if any other books, have. And so we bring them to the point of uh, saying, well, maybe there are still some problems, but then we could always take them and should take them to the final stage. And that's where they say, yes, I can trust the Bible. I understand what you're saying. And I have come to the point of also believing that the Bible is the authentic Word of God. So this is the flow chart of how we will um, answer the questions that people have.
Okay, part A, second and third hand information about the Bible leads to false impressions. What kind of false impressions are we talking about? Well, some people will say this, God helps those who help themselves, as if this is in the Bible, but it's not a biblical uh, injunction, it's uh, extra biblical. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, where do we find that in the Bible? Uh, or they may bring up the two so-called contradictory creation accounts in Genesis 1 and 2. And that's usually because they really haven't read carefully the, uh, the contents of Genesis 1 and 2. And they don't know what the historical value of the words or the concepts or the whole import of Genesis uh, would, is dealing with. And so we need to take them back to those passages and explain what they're talking about and explain any um, misconceptions because there are many misconceptions. B, the Old Testament and New Testament documents pass three crucial tests and these are the tests that we will dwell on for a bit and these are the tests that you should uh, understand and use in your apologetics. First of all, there's the bibliographic test, and this has three parts. We want to look at the manuscript quantity, for there are more uh, manuscripts from the New Testament than any other book of ancient times, and that is significant. So the quantity is significant. The quality is very significant. For example, the Old Testament is uh, excellent. We have a very careful trail of copyists. Um, or copies of the Old Testament through time. The, the Jews were very, very careful in what they did in uh, copying the, the Old Testament. So we, we can see from the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and um, they were, they're dated to about 200 years before Christ, and up until the time of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the, the 40s, 1940s, uh, the earliest copies we had of the Old Testament were all oh, around 980, and people were questioning the validity of uh, those um, those um, scriptures. And then, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were put into play and translated and shown to be virtually the same as the 900 um, uh, the the manuscripts in the 900s then people understood that there was a very, very careful transmission, um, at least for a, a thousand years before. And uh, so that, that helped uh, people understand the, the, uh, the carefulness of the, the, the copyists. New Testament, we're also going to see that the, uh, the documents, the evidence for the documents is very good, especially for the quality of the, uh, the copy. And then the third part would be the manuscript time span. The Old Testament held by Dead Sea Scrolls shows that we can go back to about 200 years before Christ, which is uh, unheard of for documents uh, of ancient times. We don't have those. They have uh, disappeared. We just have copies of copies of copies. Uh, and as I said, many of those are from the 800s and the 900s AD, even though they may have been first written, the originals may have been written hundreds or thousands of years before Christ. The New Testament, written in the first 100 years um, of this millennium, of this uh, age, of the first millennium after Christ, uh, also shows that we have a very close um, time span from the original copies. Now I should say that um, when we talk about originals, well maybe I should show a chart and uh, deal with the quantity and then we'll get to the time span. It'll make more sense. When we look at the quantity, we can see that um, we have over 24,000 manuscripts of the, uh, the New Testament. Now, what does that mean? Well, when we compare with the best of the ancient documents, um, which is the Iliad of uh, Homer, 
there would only be 643 manuscripts um, from that uh, particular work compared to 24,000 uh, for the New Testament. That shows that um, we have a preponderance of evidence and manuscripts that we can compare with one another to try to figure out what is the best um, wording, which words were the original words, and so on. I'll explain more about that in a little bit. Okay, we can see that um, of the Greek um, examples, we have about 5,000 extant. In fact, that number keeps going up. We have um, over 5,400 at this point of uh, extant. Extant means existing Greek manuscripts. Those would be some of the earliest ones that we would have. And uh, we'll talk about the different types, the unctuals, the minuscules, the lectionaries, papyri, and so on. The Latin Vulgate, translated about the early 4th century by Jerome. Um, we have about 10,000 early copies of that, uh, which is very helpful in looking at a comparison value. The uh, Ethiopic, Slavic, Armenian, uh, Peshetta, uh, the Syriac, um, translation of the New Testament and so on. Arabic coming in after the seventh, after really in the late eighth century. Um, and so on. So uh, the first uh, six or seven or eight hundred years after Christ we have uh, a number of copies that we can use for comparing um, the wording so that we can go back to the, uh, the closest to the original. And what does that mean in comparison to others? Well, here you have two values. You have uh, the blue showing the time gap in years and the red showing the number of manuscript copies. But with the New Testament, what is uh, unique is that we have the, uh, the shortest value in the number of years, the time gap between the, uh, the original writing of that manuscript and the earliest copy. And we'll see that um, we have some fragments that are within 25 years of when John wrote, actually wrote his gospel. Uh, and I'm referring to the John Ryland papyrus. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that we have a uh, copy that is very close to the original, so therefore it would not have much time for any changes to take place. And when you look at all the other works of ancient history, um, especially when you look at something like uh, Homer's work, well, the earliest we have of, uh, of uh, any of his copies would be 500 years. The earliest of others, like Demosthenes, um, 1,400 years. Same with Herodotus, Plato, Tacitus, Caesar, Pliny. Um, it's Most of those works are... Um, you know, almost a, a, a thousand years after. That's the earliest copy that we have. So how can we have uh, that much uh, reliance on their um, consistency or their authenticity or that they haven't been uh, copied with errors? If, if we're talking about errors and copious errors, we, we have to compare these things. And when we talk about scriptures, people are going to be very careful about copying scriptures because this is uh, considered the Word of God, whereas um, other things are maybe good poetry or, or stories, but uh, they would not have the, the same life values. What about manuscript copies? This is another very important um, aspect, and you can see the long... Uh, bar here representing uh, just the Greek uh, extant copies. Now 5,686 according to this chart compared with Homer 643. When you look at the others and you have just a few um, manuscript copies of these particular ones. Ten of uh, Caesar's work are the earliest a thousand years after he wrote it. You know, before 66 BC because that's when he died. But think, 66 B.C., and we find it almost uh, 900, in the early 900s, that's the earliest copy. We only have 10 of those early copies compared to 
uh, thousands of New Testament copies and some of those copies being within 25 years of the original. So that is very significant, especially when we consider that the New Testament compared to any other ancient book is uh, much greater um, in its number of manuscripts and the time gap much smaller than any of the others. So that will be important in the comparison value. Okay, again with the quality, let's look especially at um, a comparison between Homer's Iliad, uh, written about 900 BC. The earliest copy we have is 400 BC, which shows a, a time gap of 500 years, and um, we only have 643 copies of a book which was considered the textbook for scholars in the ancient world. Now, when we look at the New Testament, and we Note that it was written between 40 to 100 A.D. Uh, the earliest copy we have uh, is dated about 125 A.D., and that's a, a fragment of John's Gospel, which was written between 90 to 95, and some say even up to 100 A.D. Time span then would be 25 to 35 years, and we have collectively over 24,000 of these early copies uh, of the manuscript. So the manuscript quality... Um, is very good. The time span is much shorter and the quantity of course is much greater. And yet uh, when we look at Homer's Iliad people say that uh, well there's a 5% error rate in whether it was transmitted correctly or not. So 95% accurate compared to the New Testament which um, many scholars and not all of them Christian, some of them coming from the outside will will say, yes, because of the quantity, because of the quality, uh, because of the time span being so small, we can give a value of 99.5% accuracy, which is unheard of in uh, dealing with ancient documents. So it's far greater than any other document, especially when you consider that Homer's Iliad is the next best um, verified or reliable uh, document of that uh, ancient world.